Good afternoon to people in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Sydney. And good morning to people in London, Paris, and Milan. Welcome to Finance Mandarin's Reading Club. I am Tara from Finance Mandarin. Firstly, I thank you all for joining us from different parts of the world. In this episode of the Finance Mandarin Reading Club, we are going to dive into the book named Financial Cold War by Mr. James Falk. This book particularly looks into the insight of the tension between China and the US. And this includes a comprehensive examination of the development of the financial markets in China and the US, the roles of Hong Kong in the global financial market, and some effective strategies for policymaking to alleviate the US ten and Sino tension. If you're interested in the international relations and financial markets, this is the book you should not miss out on. First of all, please allow me to introduce you to our host today, Vian Lee, the CEO of Finance Mandarin. Vian has over 20 years of experience coaching CEOs, investment professionals, and lawyers from the buy side to sell side of the capital market. Let's welcome Vian to say hi to us. Hi, welcome our students, alumni, and connection to join the event. And particularly welcome some of students maybe join the uh, VIP room today. We have 120 professionals registered for this wonderful event. So again, I welcome James. He's going to share with us this wonderful book. And I thank you for him for sending me one. And I read it and I have lots of questions it's going to ask him. And welcome for the floor and the different people in different social media send us the questions. James. It has a lot of similarity like our current students, bilingual by culture, and come from a family with a Hong Kong and British parents, and married with an American wife with two lovely kids. And he studied overseas for finance and legal and working for investment bank, like you working for the financial sector, either buy side or sell side. So he has experienced a lot understand both the Western market and the Asian capital market. And he working for the Hong Kong State Exchange for nine years. He has a lot of first-hand information to share with us. So let's come start. Back to you, Tara. Thank you, Rian, for introducing Mr. James Falk. And um, so without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Falk to the stage. Uh, well, first of all, th thank you for that very kind introduction, Vien, and, and for inviting me to come and speak today. And th thank you to everyone for attending this, this webinar. I'm slightly overwhelmed by the number of people who've dialed in to this. I I'm going to talk today about four things broadly. First, what, what is the financial Cold War? Second, how has it come about? Third, what are the consequences for us of not addressing this problem? And fourthly, I'd like to give you a framework for finding a path out of what, what I believe is quite a precarious position that, that we find ourselves in today. This is obviously a very short synopsis given the limited time of what's in my book. Hopefully it will pique your interest uh, to read the whole thing uh, after this session today. So what is the financial Cold War? Most people hear that term and they think about sanctions, trade wars, uh, and other things like that. Well, that, that, those are things that I do talk about in the book, but which I call a geoeconomic war. And those actions, I believe, are actually a spillover effect of the financial Cold War, which has been going on far before any of these things began to happen. As I define it in the book, the financial Cold War is the conflict embedded in the structure of the global financial system and national financial policies, which have been driving higher levels of wealth and income inequality. And it is the rising wealth and income inequality spilling over into social tensions that have led to the geoeconomic war, and which, if we leave unaddressed, may spill over into worse aggravated conflicts. So to understand how this financial Cold War has come about, you really need to delve into 
the histories of how the financial markets have developed in the US and in China. In, in the book, I identify the opening shot of this financial cold war as being the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944. This is the agreement struck at the end of the Second World War that embedded the US dollar at the center of the global monetary system. This was a step that, while it's had many benefits for many actors operating across borders, created a financial imbalance which has since grown and metastasized. And if we continue to leave this unaddressed, it is likely to become worse and worse over time. To give you a, a sense of the, the type of conflict that it leads to, uh, I believe that most people here will be familiar with the, the debate and disagreements and conflicts that have taken place over exchange rates. Uh, and that, that was particularly fierce in the early 2000s. What many Americans today believe is that other countries and particularly less developed country exporters have been holding down the values of their currencies in order to steal US jobs. Now, that, that's, that, there's certainly some truth to that up to a point, but that, that is a very one-sided perspective on this issue. And really, the, the, when you look at it from the perspective of other countries, and particularly smaller countries whose governments and companies have to borrow in US dollars, the US dollar has been a massive source of risk and volatility. Over the course of the 1980s, 1990s, and since then, what, what's happened to a lot of emerging markets countries is that when periodically you see a, a bout of dollar volatility and their currencies have fallen against the dollar, it's made that US dollar borrowing very difficult to repay, which has led to bankruptcies, it's led to job losses, it's led to a, a whole load of economic misery and human misery for a lot of the citizens of those countries and for, for many actors involved. Emerging market countries started to get a little bit smarter about how they dealt with this problem, particularly after the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s. And what, what they did to ensure themselves against these periodic bouts of dollar volatility was to start holding large amounts of US dollar reserves, particularly in the form of US treasuries. What, what this did essentially was to exacerbate an existing problem, which was to create a structural overvaluation of the dollar because of demand for dollars for the purposes of international trade and investment. How this impacted Americans really depended on where in society you sit. So if you, are the, if you were the wealthy shareholder of a large US corporation that was able to export their production to lower cost centers because the currency was overvalued or the other country's currency was undervalued against the dollar, then you were able to reduce your cost base, increase your profit margins, and your share price, you've seen your share price go up by huge amounts. If you've been over the last 40 years a US manufacturing worker, you, you perhaps haven't fared so well. Generally for those people, what you've experienced over that period of time is displacement, job losses, or at best uh, a level of wage, wage stagnation. Of course, it's not only the dollar that's been the problem uh, in this financial cold war. There are other aspects to it. As trade and investment around the world has globalized, all countries have wanted to attract financial investment into them. And what this has given the temptation towards is what, what I call global fiscal competition, which is that each country essentially was trying to compete with each other on having lower rates of tax. 
this made it very difficult for countries when they needed to raise tax to raise taxes on particularly the owners of capital, generally because capital has been far more mobile than labor. When you raise taxes, people, corporations move their investment out, rich people move their money out, and that has economic consequences for you. And so what, what this has gradually led to is more and more balmy taxation systems, which have really been quite unfair because what it's generally seen is rich people paying much lower rates of taxation than average middle class workers, simply because more of their earnings come from capital than from their own labor. The, the financial Cold War has also encompassed issues such as failures in antitrust enforcement, different social welfare models or, or lack thereof. And executive compensation and other financial incentives. So, a lot of this, many of you will be familiar in terms of the US context. And it's, I think, it's widely recognized now that widening wealth and income inequality has led to huge social problems in the US. But what about China? So, China actually, over the past 40 years, has done rather well. It's come from being dirt poor to, frankly, you know, a moderate level of prosperity across the whole country. And if you go to the largest Chinese cities today, these are some of the most modern and most prosperous cities in the world. What China has very successfully done is it's harnessed the one-time demographic dividend that they've had from like many parts of the world, they had a baby boom that led into the 1970s, but China's demographic dividend has been particularly powerful because of the one-child policy implemented in the late 1970s. What this meant was that you had a huge growth in the working age population, but fewer dependence to depend on each working age population. So this created a huge amount of savings in the Chinese system, which the Chinese government through the state-owned banking system went on to harness in order to drive the, the development of China's infrastructure that has enabled the export juggernaut that you see today and enabled the amount of prosperity that, that we see in many parts of China today. The, the problem with this model is that while it's been extremely successful in the early parts of development, it is not sustainable in the long term going forward. And what I argue in the book is that China is at a critical juncture today where they need to start looking to change the, the operating model of the economy. And the, the particular risks that exist in the Chinese economic model today, I believe many of you will be familiar with, but essentially you've got a huge demographic cliff facing the country, whereby because of a shrinking population and particularly a shrinking working age population. A model that has been founded on more and more investment to build more infrastructure, more homes, as the population starts to shrink, is likely to lead to more and more misallocation of investment, which is going to drive on economic growth. At the same time as the, the demographic cliff is already starting to drag on the economy. And really, China's social stability has really been founded on a social contract that has ensured that the population has, over a long period of time, experienced increasing standards of living. If that goes into reverse, then there are significant risks for China. Th this is a big part of the reason why the, the Chinese government has been so keen to 
try and improve uh, the use of robotic automation. It's the, one of the largest users of industrial robots around the world today. And it, it is also why the Chinese government is trying to encourage people to go out and have more babies. History has shown that financial markets are an incredibly powerful driver of human civilization. They have enabled populations to trade and interact with each other in, through a system of contracts rather than through a system of pillaging. They, they've enabled capital to be allocated to where it's been able to be most productively used. And it's enabled specialization, which, which has driven huge increases in human standards of living, huge innovation. But financial markets ultimately work within institutional frameworks. And where those frameworks and where the rules and regulations that underpin them drive the wrong types of incentives and drive the wrong types of behavior, then huge imbalances can occur. And when these imbalances occur, and particularly in the form of rising wealth and income inequality, history has also shown us that this can have catastrophic events, uh, effects. Any student of the Mississippi bubble will understand that that's was something that ultimately led to, that was the first stock market bubble ever. That was something that ultimately led to the French Revolution uh, a little over half a century later. I think the students of World War II will also understand that many of the financial imbalances and particularly the, the Great Depression in the 1930s and hyperinflation in Germany in the 1920s were big contributors to that conflict. So suffice it to say, this is a problem that is highly risky for the whole world and which we, we need to address with caution and urgency. The, the fundamental purposes of markets, if we take a step back, uh, I, I know that many of you are, are in the financial services industry and people have different points of view. I think most people in the financial service industry look at it as a means of just making more money. But if you step back and think about what financial markets were originally invented for, the, the social and fundamental purposes that they serve are in allocating capital to the most efficient place where that capital can be used and in the form of sharing risks and where that's been where that's been where that has taken place it's enabled specialization it's enabled investment to go into innovation and it's helped massively improve the quality of human life over history but where these incentives or where markets have malfunctioned, which I, I believe is the case in many of the structures and incentives that exist today, then they, they've driven huge social problems and catastrophic events throughout the course of history. So how, how do we move forward? Essentially, in a word, we need to make our financial system work in a better way to drive more inclusive and fairer growth for everyone so that everyone can enjoy the, the fruits of economic prosperity. And you know, that, that's not to say, I, I, I will hasten to add that you know, I'm, not a, I'm not a rabid socialist or a, a, I'm not a rabid communist, but, and, what I'm not advocating is that everyone should have equal outcomes. But what, what I am advocating is that most people should have equal opportunities, or at least as equal as we can possibly give them. The, the other point that I would like to make 
in taking this forward is that there are people out there today who advocate a new Cold War thinking that, or believe that we're in a new Cold War and actually welcome the new Cold War thinking that this is going to be something that helps drive human innovation, improvement, or at least help America address a level of its political dysfunction today. The, the reality is that people who believe that, I believe, are A, wrong-headed, and those who advocate it, I think, are quite irresponsible, simply because today, as opposed to the Cold War that existed between the US and the Soviet Union in the last century, China and America are so intertwined through the channels of trade and investment that each of them would stand to lose significantly through the social and economic harm done to the other. So the, the two countries have no option but to cooperate. How do you address the problem? Well, look, it's not going to be easy. And I, I look at, in chapter eight of the book, a, a framework of, of how these things may be done. But essentially, to summarize, we, we need to move very rapidly towards finding a new system for the global monetary, a new model for the global monetary system, which reduces its dependence on US dollars that sits at the heart of many of the imbalances that have created. We need to cooperate on creating fairer tax systems. And this, I believe we've made a good first step on with the G7 agreement on global minimum corporate tax rates last year. But there's a lot more that needs to be done to be able to give that agreement teeth. We, we also want a financial system which avo avoids excessive control by any single party, simply because if you have that kind of control, however good your intentions are at the outset, that the reality is that there, there comes very easily the temptation to use that for dishonorable or uh, malintentioned reasons. Uh, James, well, James, up to here. You, yep. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we do have some time limit. Yes, yep. thank you. I think you actually gave a very good overview about the book and also your opinion. That's very, very useful. From part one and part two and part three, you gave a very good uh, overview. And then we do have some uh, questions that want to throw in for you. Thank you for sharing. But as I say here, when people were doing business, we're talking about the facts. We're sharing op opinion. Yet whether you disagree or agree, we we'll keep our graciousness. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So um, you, you understand a lot you're talking about China. You mentioned about like um, one child policy, aging and infrastructures. And actually we have a question for you here. Uh, what does that mean, common prosperity? Uh, what does that mean in China? And what does it mean in US? Do you have any opinion about that? This is actually one of the key concepts. Actually, we're talking about common prosperity here. Okay. So common, pros common prosperity, I think, is actually a, a, very, is a very good thing. And it is a recognition, I think, before it's too late, that China has also seen massive rises in wealth and income inequality. And to maintain social stability over the long term, now that we, we've had that period of capital accumulation and wealth growth, and Deng Xiaoping was very open in saying that he wanted some people to go out and get rich first. So what, what, what we now have is a relatively prosperous society where the, the prosperity is not very well shared in amongst the population. And problem prosperity, I don't believe is a move away from, it's not a move away from markets. Many people mistake this to be the case, but it, it is simply allowing a, a greater sharing of that prosperity and particularly looking at 
you know, competitive abuses or, or monopoly abuses in certain industries that have the effect of stifling competition and abusing both customers and employees and holding down potential wages, potential wage increases for employees in those industries. So I generally believe that I generally believe that common prosperity is a good thing. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, China has the uh, China has the ability. Sorry, unfortunately, in America, unlike China, which has the wherewithal to cut through a lot of red tape, cut through a lot of legal systems to implement these measures, that the U.S. system of government has many more checks and balances, and it also has the the issue of Congress to get through. And so it's very, very much more difficult to implement these types of moves. And in that sense, that the U.S., I fear, is you know, at greater risk of allowing the, the wealth and income inequality to perpetuate and exacerbate today. Thank you. In your books here, I went through your book, especially in chapter two, talking about a uh, um, characteristic of China's capitalism. You mentioned about that. This is all the key work you could find in the book here. And then James have very clear explanation and with story in context, with historical background to explain it to you. If you want to know more about it, this book would be a very good reference. So another question, James, is about, you mentioned about the financial cold war. So that's just a question. It seems that the front line of the financial cold war is the stock market on both sides. What's your opinion? Some talking about the DD two things, IPO in US, and then after two days, it got uh, the app in China was banned, and then six months later, DD was the rumor planning to delist in US and get back to Hong Kong next to list. So all reported by Bloomberg. What's your opinion? Well, look. I mean, the the first of all, um, yes, these things have happened. Uh, to using the the terminology as I d define the book, th these are not the financial cold war. The financial cold war, in as I define it in the book, is the the underlying drivers or sources of tension. So what what you're seeing today is these things spill over into geo geoeconomic warfare. And you know, th this is ultimately caused by tensions between the two countries where th there's fear that countries are your countries are using financial means to attack or, or contain strategic rivals. I, I, I generally believe this to be a relatively unhealthy phenomenon, particularly because th there will continue the US has huge needs for capital. China has a huge amount of capital, and it has particularly $35 trillion in savings uh, that needs to be deployed into capital markets to help fund the retirements of the aging Chinese population. And, and also, for, from China's perspective, the, the domestic capital markets today, large as they are, are simply not deep enough to allow that capital to be deployed quickly. And so China also needs access to international capital markets. And when it accesses international capital markets, it needs to be, it needs to be confident that it's going to be safe. What, one of the big problems that an inhibitors to China internationalizing outwards or allowing more Chinese investors to invest capital outside of China and Hong Kong is that that the plumbing of the system today, whether it's the, the payment network SWIFT or the ICSDs, where those securities are safe kept, or, or the global uh, custodians, or all of those are either controlled by the US or heavily influenced by the US. And given the, the current geopolitical tensions between the two, it, it's very difficult for them to put themselves at that financial security risk where if a Chinese company happens to be drilling oil, for instance, in a country which the, the US uh, doesn't like or, or has under sanction, then there's the risk that, you know, that the treasury funds of that company could be frozen if they're held in 
an infrastructure or a safekeeping infrastructure uh, that is susceptible to US pressure. And so the, the, the solution ultimately, I believe, is going to be able to be finding channels for cross-border investment that do not give any single country excessive control over that system such that they can abuse it. Obviously, there, there are good reasons for imposing financial sanctions sometimes, you know, terrorism, uh, avoidance of money laundering and, and other things like that. But th those should be governed through the appropriate bodies such as the, the UN and the UN Security Council rather than unilaterally applied by any single country. Thank you. In your book there, you particularly mention about different um, Chinese finance regulators. You mentioned about PBOC, CBIRC, yep. CSRC, especially talking about Yigang and Guo um, Shuqing. So for your understanding, you got the first hand information as a lot of our students, they joined the delegations to visit the Chinese finance regulators. So you understand the financial market in the Western world, and also you understand the Asian capital market, especially in China world well, because you get the first hand information. So what kind of special tips or insight that you want to share with our student, our audience today? Um, I don't know about tips or insight, but I think what one huge lesson that I learned um, or two huge lessons I learned. Um, what, one is that actually the, the financial regulators in China, or, although you, you may disagree with many of the things that they do, are, are really quite thoughtful about the, the structure of their markets. The, the second is uh, the, the importance of keeping an open mind. And I, I, I'll share a story, which is probably one of the more professionally embarrassing that, that I've had in my lifetime. But when we were negotiating the, the first stock connect between HKEX and Shanghai Stock Exchange, I remember very clearly one conversation that I had with my counterpart at Shanghai Stock Exchange, Fu Hao, who's mentioned in the book. The, the conversation wasn't going very well, and it was over a particular, over a particular detail of implement, implementation of the scheme. And I got very frustrated and he said, well, why, why do you want to do it like this? And I said, well, this, this is international practice. This is how it's done everywhere. And he said, but, but why? And I suddenly, it suddenly dawned on me. I had thought that he just didn't understand, but it suddenly dawned on me that he actually perfectly understood that this was international practice. He just looked at it and he hadn't agreed with it. And I, I wasn't in the position to really understand why it was like that. I just knew it was done like that. And also, I was particularly embarrassed that I didn't understand his market well enough, that I could understand the constraints that he might have operated under. And so certainly that was a big spur for me to educate myself both more deeply about how the international financial markets operated, but particularly how the, the Chinese financial markets operate and how the, the structure of them has come about. So indeed, it's a very good uh, story to share with us. Yeah, it's more as like you have to understand others and understand yourself and being more open-minded. I think that's what all our students, when they are learning a language, is open a door and to the world. A very good ex uh, experience. Thank you for sharing. And, and now the other question is following in as like about the listing rules regulations reform in Hong Kong, because your book is actually mentioned about one thing is what is the role of Hong Kong? This is a, as you were born in Hong Kong, and then you have a deep uh, passion and try to make Hong Kong and still keep as a financial hub, And then the, for the changing of the IPO regulations, and then many, China company can choose either list in Hong Kong X or New York or other city. So for this one, what do you think about in the, under this kind of tension of China and US, any, any trend will be different. What's your opinion about it? Well, first of all, I would say that Hong Kong has played an incredibly important role 
in the in not just finance but but in as a bridge between China and international markets, whether it's in trade or, or in capital markets. And the, this role has arisen out of the differences in the two systems, which are, are because they've come about very differently, uh, are very difficult to entirely reconcile. And so Hong Kong has done incredibly well by actually as an entrepreneur and in intermediating the, the trade between the, the two countries. I think, you know, as, as time has gone on, Hong Kong's adapted its role. But what I would also say is that the, the Chinese financial markets have grown incredibly quickly. They, they've invested in infrastructure, they've invested in technology. And but for Hong Kong today, although we're still doing very well, I don't think that we can for one moment rest on our laurels because simply put, Hong Kong as a financial center rests on a regulatory and legal arbitrage between the mainland and the rest of the world. And th those differences are narrowing day by day. The, the Chinese financial centers are getting more efficient, they're improving their technology, they're making their rules more palatable to international investors. International fund managers are already directly going to the onshore market to raise capital there. And if we don't continue to innovate in Hong Kong, then we run the risk of being disintermediated in the same way that many other middleman industries in Hong Kong have been disintermediated mm. over the past 20 years. And so I think today that the particular value that Hong Kong has, particularly as we've got these geopolitical tensions, is as a safekeeping center for Chinese for international investors in Chinese securities and for Chinese investors in international securities. If the, those securities are held here, then although they're sitting in China, they operate under a effectively an English common law legal system that, that is familiar to all parties uh, and which can essentially act as a, as a safe place for, to do business for both China and for international parties. And that really is, is probably not primarily going to be in the, the stock market space anymore as uh, the as growth slows down, as China's population ages, as the, the economy changes shape, the, the, the greater likelihood is that debt issuance will become a, a far, far bigger market than equity issuance, which is what Hong Kong's really specialized in today. And that we, we need to move in that direction. Yeah, indeed. As Laura Cha, the chairman of Hong Kong EX, also reiterate and emphasize, we do have confidence in Hong Kong as a bridge between the East and the West. Okay, so the last question, we're talking about the futures. Now, currently, we're all talking about digital assets, a climate change or a carbon neutral, ESG, green finance. In this area, what are the major conflicts between China and US? I think that's a big question. <laughs> So if we want to have time, what would be your one sentence to summarize this big issue? I, I think that the, the threat is, is far further off than anyone believes. But I do believe that the technology that I, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily a full subscriber of, of the long-term survival of all cryptocurrencies that are out there today, but the technology will be game-changing. And new infrastructures will develop around those technologies and huge power will flow to the parties that control that infrastructure. Hence, this, this needs to be constructed in a way that looks after the interests of all parties in the system. Well said. Right. We actually running up time. We are over one, a bit polarized for, for keeping James a bit longer here. So Tara, let's round up for today. And I thank you for the people. Tara, that's your turn. Thank you, James and Vienne, for your thoughtful sharing. 
I shall wrap it up now. If you target the China capital market, come to Finance Mandarin. We help senior executives to learn the firsthand China market knowledge and polish your business Mandarin communication skills. With our advanced AI learning platform, you'll be able to access to the course content whenever you are. If you are a busy professional who wants to maximize your investment in, in learning, Finance Mandarin is the right place for you. For more course details and tips for learning Mandarin, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Book your trial class now with us. I thank you once again for joining us today, and I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Thank you.